get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Anna Guzma Boussa. I am the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And it is my great pleasure to welcome today Benjamin Smith, who is the associate, an associate professor of political science at the University of Florida. He received his PhD from the University of Washington and was an academy fellow at the Harvard Academy for Area and International Studies. He's widely recognized as an, expert, as an expert in the politics of resource wealth, and his book, Hard Times in the Land of Plenty, compared Iran and Indonesia, two resource-rich countries whose political trajectories diverge profoundly over the courses of the 60s and 70s. And he was one of the first people to argue that it's really the political and economic context that happens to determine these divergence. His other work focuses on ethnic conflict and ethnic struggles, on post-colonial post states and redistribution, single-party autocratic rule, and the politics of Southeast Asia. So please join me today in welcoming him as he presents Learning to Love Oil. Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here. I, I might be the only person in Florida who can say honestly, it's always nice to leave Florida and come up to experience real winter weather in January. But having grown up in Alaska, this is, this is a nice, it's almost like home in the spring. Um, so thank you, thank you for the invitation. Um, Anna didn't mention that I actually stole her office at Harvard. I um, hung around annoyingly until she packed her books and left. Um, but uh, anyway, so I'm going to talk about um, learning to love oil today. And this is not a riff on drill, baby, drill. Um, it's kind of a corrective to a, well, the dominant theme in applied policy recommendations for resource-rich developing countries. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, kind of an observation that 20 years ago, um, and I can say this quite personally, nobody cared in economics or political science about the politics of oil wealth. In fact, when I proposed what became my dissertation topic and later my first book to my advisor, he said, I really think you want a different project. This is in 1998. And he said, and I quote, no one cares about oil, and no one cares about authoritarianism. Um, now, the one time in my life that being stupidly stubborn paid off, um, I didn't listen, and fortunately now people do care about oil and autocracy. Um, and, of course, we really care about it these days. Um, the price of oil, one year later, in 1999, tripled and has been pretty high ever since. Right? It's been perfect timing for, for Vladimir Putin, who became president very shortly after that. Perfect timing for Hugo Chavez, who became president at about the same time. Um, perfect timing for a number of uh, developing country rulers. Um, but we see, on the one hand, we see some glaringly unstable oil-rich countries, and we see some really glaring success stories. Um, and it's that divergence that, that points to a, um, a needed corrective for this idea that, um, that, the, that the resource curse is the, the dominant effect of oil and other natural resources in developing countries. Um, and th the strange thing is that this, this kind of mononarrative about resources being cursed flies in the face of a lot of accumulating evidence, some of which I'll talk about today. Um, and you know that accumulating evidence, to quote one of my favorite UM faculty, Pauline Jones Long, oil is not a curse, right? Um, I'm going to argue that, in fact, it's not a curse. And even well beyond the question of ownership, Oil under most conditions is not a curse. Under most conditions, it's a modest blessing, um, with, with a few exceptions. Um, so why does it matter? Um, we've got this massive narrative. Up there in the right is actually a line from an email the Resource Curse Scholar sent me. Um, and you know, for those of you who are interested in Thomas Kuhn's notion of scientific revolutions, that was a kind of an honest Kuhnian moment um, for the Resource Curse paradigm. If countries begin to solve the resource curse, my career will go up in smoke. Um, so it matters, right? Because on the one hand, in the policy world, um, policy makers and policy advisors have taken on board one strain of thought in, in the study of the politics of resource wealth. And most of it um, focuses on solving this curse. Uh, so. The problem, again, is that the evidence for this curse looks pretty shaky. And it raises the question, you know, how solid, right, how confident can we really be that this one line of policy recommendations is the best one and the one that we ought to be pursuing? Um, again, you know, given, 
given the importance of some prominent oil-rich countries in, in big global crises today, uh, it's less necessary for me to convince you that oil and politics matters. Um, but let me, let me revisit some numbers anyway. So 15 years ago, um, for a number of reasons, mostly having to do with the oil bust of the mid-1980s to the late 1990s, there were about 20 significant oil producers in the world. Today there are 50. And that's a function of a number of changes. One's price hikes, right? Even at $50 a barrel, it's still substantially more expensive, um, even in current dollars, than oil was in 1998, right? So even given this crash, we haven't fallen back to the bust years. Um, technology has improved, and as different levels of, of extractive technology have become profitable, especially um, hydraulic fracturing and shale beds, um, we've seen more and more oil reserves come online. And improved governance in a bunch of developing countries has made them more attractive investment targets than used to be the case. And this is a kind of interesting twist because we often think about big multinational oil companies like Shell, BP, Exxon as being kind of heavy-handed and, and able to exert their will on, on rather docile developing country governments. But the reality is that um, for so long, these countries um, really were not at all the investment target um, of, of big multinational oil companies. In fact, the estimates are that about 80% of the rich world's natural resource reserves, especially fuel, that is oil, gas, and coal, have already been uncovered and exploited. That is the, the, basically the, the advanced industrial world. And only about 20% of the developing world has yet to, has been discovered and begun to be exploited, which is to say, the developing world is likely to see four times as much in the way of fuel reserves discovered in the future as it has to date. And in, in large measure, that's a function of um, the increasing perceived attractiveness to foreign investors. Um, the role of natural gas is growing too, and I'll talk briefly about that a little bit later in the lecture, and, and largely because the, the delivery mode, the fact that it's a gas and, and is largely transmitted through pipelines and not just pumped out of the ground into barrels and then put on uh, cargo tankers, uh, means that um, pipeline owners have a kind of, of leverage that, that oil exporters don't. Um, so talking about its role in the world economy. Um, if the world commodity trade in a given year amounted to $100, 90 of them would come from oil. And gold and diamonds and copper and everything else, including agriculture, would account for $10. Um, we sometimes miss what, what a massive share of the world's commodity trade oil comes to. Um, this in addition to the fact that, you know, the way that we live today is utterly unthinkable without oil. Um, every one of the chairs you're all sitting in is made of petroleum, um, at least in part. Um, not a very pleasant thought, but, you know, kind of is what it is, right? You know, Daniel Jurgen described us as, as uh, living hydrocarbon lives, and, and to a very real extent that's true. Um, it's also true that, that a number of high-profile crises today, the Syrian civil war has revealed to us that for the first time, oil, like diamonds, especially secondary diamonds, has become a lootable resource, right? And IS, or ISIL, or whatever its, its current acronym is, has been smuggling oil out of Syria's fields, um, pumping it into barrels, and then um, trucking it across the border into southern Turkey and selling it um, as a way of making money. And to this, to my knowledge, uh, is the first time that we've seen a rebel movement successfully in fairly large volume, looting and then reselling oil, uh, which is to say it's, you know, it's, it's starting to look at the micro level more like secondary diamonds and drugs than, than it ever did before. Um, and of course, you know, one of the key issues in what happens with Ukraine, both for Western Europe and for Russia, is its continued status as a major pipeline transit country, right, until this, this new pipeline through Turkey is, is complete, um, for better or for worse, Russia is going to have to continue to move natural gas, which is an increasingly large share of its resource revenues through Ukraine. Um, fortunately now, it's not this question, and I don't have to convince my advisor any longer that um, people do care about oil and autocracy, because um, I have tenure. Um, so we all care about oil for a whole lot of reasons, right? Even if it's currently a lot less expensive than it was six months ago. Right? It fuels the way we live, and it continues to be implicated in some really important global crises. But I'm going to suggest 
um, that, that shouldn't stop us from digging deeper and doing the best scholarly job that we can to figure out exactly what its effects are, right? What, what the really powerful systematic trends are in what we can say about the political effects of oil wealth. Um, so I'm going to talk about some initial um, results from um, an article, which is, is kind of the basis for a book project that will be called Learning to Love Oil, Right Sizing the Resource Curse. Um, and I'm going to shy away as much as I can from the really boring aspects of measuring oil wealth and, and talk about the practical aspects of measuring it and the practical results of some of these early um, analyses that I've done. Um, and this being the International Institute, I've, I've hived off all the statistics and hidden them at the end. And I'm happy to talk about them if you like, um, but I'm not going to put them front and center in the, in the talk today. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to ask, and we can certainly, we can certainly move to those. Um, so the bigger project is um, to take what I think is a better measure, better statistical measure of oil wealth, a uh, conceptually good one, and to revisit this, this um, resource curse or the conflict resource curse. And so I won't be talking today about the effect of oil and regime type directly. I'll be talking about it some. I won't be talking very much about the effects of oil wealth on economic development. Um, but I will be putting my own findings into dialogue with an, a growing number of scholars who find, one, that uh, resource wealth does not, in fact, induce authoritarian rule. Uh, in fact, uh, the evidence suggests that if there's any kind of effect, it's a mild pro-democratic effect, and that increasingly we don't see any negative effect of oil wealth on long-term economic growth and development. Uh, and so put in that context, the results that I have um, on political stability and on the role of oil in, in lessening the risk of conflict um, are very much in line with this increasing number of, of studies finding that, that um, we don't need to think so much about oil being solely a curse. Um, okay. So the main conclusion, the main conclusion um, that I'm going to make today is that um, oil is a systematically stabilizing force in the domestic politics of oil-rich countries. Um, and that, statistically speaking, if we ask whether that's because oil makes a country more stable than its neighbor next door, which is similar but oil poor, or whether it's the case that over time, when a country gains access to more oil revenues, it becomes more stable, or when it loses access, it becomes less stable. In fact, it's both. And I can demonstrate statistically that it's both across country, um, that is, one, one point in time across different countries, and a within country across time effect, which is to say it stabilizes countries internally and, uh, comparatively speaking, makes them relatively more stable than their oil poor counterparts. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the bigger project at the end, but what I want to do in it is to isolate what we can say with confidence about the politics of oil wealth and then use that to think as carefully as, as possible to do about policy implications for helping developing countries with large energy, energy sectors. Then my conclusion are really suffering from other problems. They are suffering from curses, but they're not resource curses. Um, so again, the basic argument is this. Resources are conditionally stabilizing, but generally stabilizing. And they lower the risk of a bunch of different kinds of political conflict, all of which have the prospect of damaging both political and economic performance over time. Um, but it looks to be the case that different mechanisms operate to stabilize different kinds of political regimes, which is to say, autocracies get stabilized in a different way through oil than democracies do. And that's really useful to know because uh, we don't always want autocracies to be stable forever, right? We want to be, you know, normatively speaking, seeing more and more movement toward more representative and more accountable government. Um, but to the extent that oil also helps to stabilize democracies, those are the mechanisms that we want to continue and encourage. And they're precisely the ones that are missing from the resource curse policy recommendation group. Um, so as I said, I'm going to focus mostly on the effects of oil on some different kinds of conflict, but just to, to, to say it briefly, these, these findings are entirely uh, in keeping with a growing set of new studies. Um, so Stephen Haber and Victor Minaldo uh, published a series of papers finding that um, oil has no negative effect on democratic government. And if anything, it has a weak pro-democratic effect. Um, else, uh, 
Elsa Brunschweiler, and a number of co-authors, in addition to Victor Minaldo again, have found not that oil um, results in weak state institutions that provide poor governance and a weak ability to collect revenues effectively and then to redistribute them, but actually a pro-institution effect, which is to say, all else equal, um, and even one of the classic resource scholars, Michael Ross, has found this, all else equal, oil-rich states tend to have better functioning governments than oil-poor states. Um, so for a lot of reasons, oil looks to be more of a blessing than a curse. Um, and this, again, matters for policy reasons because if we can isolate the actual problems rather than seeing them as kind of masked by the reality of resource wealth, um, we stand a much better chance of developing uh, reasonable policy solutions. Um, and if it's institutions that are the problem, and I'm convinced more and more that that's the problem, it's a problem of governance that's um, cast in sharper contrast, perhaps, by resource wealth but not created by resource wealth, um, then that's, the, that's what we want to be focusing on. Um, okay. Three examples of resource-rich developing countries. Um, Chile, Botswana, and Malaysia, right? Three of the most successful examples of countries with giant resource sectors, only one of which is oil, in this case Malaysia, but three dominant resource sectors that have been successfully transformed into economic diversification that has provided long-term growth. In, in fact, Botswana had the highest average growth rate of any country in the world between 1965 and 1995. So a tremendous success story. Both Chile and Malaysia have managed to take, in Chile's case, copper dependence, in Malaysia's case, oil dependence, and transform that into burgeoning, burgeoning tech sectors, right? The chances are that those of you who own smartphones or tablets or laptops, which is to say all of us, um, probably have Malaysian chips in, in at least half of those devices. And that's a remarkable transformation that is totally missing from the resource curse sto story. So how do, we, how do we explain why it is that we've got these pretty dramatic success stories in the face of what is supposed to be a resource curse? Uh, if we can find a solid answer to those questions, we can stop chasing the kind of illusory resource curse and start focusing on the real problems. Um, I'm going to talk about the resource curse in its various iteration really briefly before I talk about um, the analysis on which this, this paper and this talk are based. Um, but the classic one is what um, economists and political scientists called originally the Rentier State thesis. And um, it basically went like this. It sort of flipped on its head the Boston Tea Party mantra of no taxation without representation and suggested that in the absence of a need to, for taxation, there was an absence of the need for representation. And so oil-rich states could accomplish their distributive goals without having to redistribute, right? They could pay um, for public goods, social services, infrastructure, education, health care, all of these things without having to tax the most wealthy in their societies. And because of that, there was no need for that original contract between economic and political elites that we think of as having spurred modern states in, in Western Europe, right? The, the origins of the modern state building system. Um, and it dates back to um, 1970, this classic article by Hussein Mahdavi on um, the Pahlavi era Iran before the revolution. And so, uh, the argument is that in the absence of the need to tax, um, you know, the, the classic core of modern in, uh, administrative states or governments, the, the extractive apparatus gets hollowed out and all of the information that it collects about how many people live in a country, what they do, where they live, all the, all the important information that states need to be able to allocate public goods effectively and equitably are gone. Right. All of that information is gone, all of the institutional imperative is gone, and you're left with a state that's basically hydroponic and that has weak, uh, if any, relations to its citizens and very little accountability. Um, so it's, it's less common in contemporary work, although still an important vein. Um, and as and is, is Anna alluded to briefly uh, when she introduced me, um, my first big project on oil found that that was only one possible trajectory of oil wealth, and in fact it was the less common one. Right, the stabilizing strong state effect was the more common one. Um, there's a second one, 
And Paul Collier and his co-authors called this the greed thesis, right, very provocatively um, to encapsulate a bunch of different economic reasons why resource wealth might make um, political conflict more likely. And at the micro level, we could think about the attractiveness of a state that owns all this resource wealth. And in most countries in the world, it's governments that own resource sectors rather than private sectors, right? We have the, the most privately owned oil sector in the world. Um, in the United States here. Most of it is much more publicly dominated. But the attractiveness of a state that if you capture it, you're, then you own the revenue, is, is kind of at the core of the logic for elites to rebel, um, and hence producing a, a greed thesis of civil war onset. But it also makes sense at the micro level for thinking about recruiting people. Because if I can tell you we're busy looting all the secondary diamonds in the territory we control, and you'll get a cut of, of you know, that, that income from the diamonds we're selling um, by being a loyal officer or foot soldier in the rebel army. That's another kind of micro-level incentive to join rebellions. Um, actually, the talk I'm going to give tomorrow about rebellions has some micro-level implications of it, and one of them is, is what things actually look like in a resource-rich area that's rebelling against its central government. Um, Finally, there's a third and a kind of a group level uh, mechanism through which resource wealth can make conflict more likely. And this is group grievances. So when we have uh, inequity across ethnic groups, of course in ethnically divided societies, especially when those um, excluded ethnic groups are home to a region that's rich in natural resources. So think of Kurdish Iraq or Aceh in Indonesia. Uh, a bunch of different examples around the developing world. Um, you can raise the prospect of, of uh, rectifying this injustice by rebelling and either grabbing more autonomy from the center or leaving altogether and creating your own state, South Sudan, right? Um, and that was the driving narrative in, in framing the South Sudanese nationalist movement. Um, so um, they basically revolve these these greed and grievance mechanisms around the opportunity and then the decision to rebel. Um, and these have kind of dominated the, uh, the policy world in terms of thinking about the resource curse, in part because so many, including Paul Collier, of the economists working on the economics of conflict were, in fact, often World Bank economists, um, at least during part of their careers. And so there was a lot of overlap, right, and a lot of interaction and a lot of kind of recursive policy recommendation developing during this time. Um, and it fell, you know, sort of against a bunch of emerging scholarship suggesting other things about the effects of oil wealth. Um, so if we think about regime stability, which is, you know, in, in statistical terms, the likelihood that in any given year a country's regime will collapse and be replaced by something else. Um, so I found a stabilizing effect for oil. Kevin Morrison, a few years later, found a stabilizing effect for oil. A few years after that, Barbara Geddes, Joe Wright, and Erica Franz found yet another systematically stabilizing effect for oil wealth. Um, when we think about civil war, um, Bulta and Brunschweiler have found a, a, a war-reducing effect for oil. Cotet and Sui found a reducing effect for oil. I found a reducing effect for oil. We think about administrative capacity, right, the, the quality of governance in, in any given country, in any given year, as a function of oil wealth. Again, Ross, myself, Victor Minaldo, uh, Matthias Basadao, and Jan Le have all found that, all else equal, oil results in, in more effective states, not less effective states. And finally, talking about democracy, right? A series of paper by, uh, papers by Stephen Haber and Victor Minaldo have found either a null effect or, or a weak pro-democratic effect. So it's not as though I'm throwing out, you know, a particular um, enigmatic statistical model and, and trying to base a whole critique on it, but there's a lot of evidence accumulating here, and it's not finding its way into the policy world. Um, for reasons I'm not exactly sure of. Um, but we're left with a lot of contradictory findings now and no easy way, way to explain our way out of this, this um, mess of contradictions. One of the possible explanations is measurement choice, right? Um, there's a reason that there's a book out there on Amazon called Damn Lies with Statistics. Um, so one of the problems that comes along is that in the effort to capture quantitatively this, some, a real-world phenomenon that we think is important and causes other things, um, we've got to figure out a way, we've got to figure out a way to measure it first. And so this is just, you know, kind of initial cut 
at extracting all the different ways that scholars have thought of to measure this phenomenon of oil wealth. One is whether or not they're a member of OPEC. So this made more sense in the 70s and 80s when OPEC dominated the oil market. But now OPEC is 12 out of 50, right? So they're not even a quarter of the world's major oil exporters anymore. Um, another one, this is number two, was to um, code countries as one if oil exports amounted more than 50% of the total exports for that country, and zero if they were 49.9% or less. Now the problem here is that we didn't really know how important exports were in the world. So we think about Canada and the United States, both with similar resource sector sizes as a share of, uh, you know, as a, as a share of the world market, um, because Canada's production has jumped up so much. But we're a country with a very prosperous population of 300 million, and the oil sector is a tiny part of our GDP and a tiny, tiny part of our total exports because we still bar legally the export of our oil. Right? And this dates back to the oil crisis. Canada, on the other hand, you know, an equally rich but a small country of 30 million people that has not made it illegal to export their oil. And so this number would look a lot bigger for Canada for reasons that are basically arbitrary, simply because um, Canada exports so much more of their oil than we do. Same is true of oil revenues as a share of GNI, oil exports as a share of exports. Now, oil export revenues as a share of GDP is getting us a little bit closer in the sense that it tells us kind of how important oil exports are in a country's GDP. But we miss something important if that's one of those diversified countries that also consumes a lot of oil, like the United States, or increasingly Brazil and Indonesia, right, for whom oil exports are an increasingly small share of their total production because their new industrial economies and post-industrial economies consume a lot of oil. Um, yet another way, oil discoveries per capita, oil discoveries to date in terms of, of billions of barrels. Um, and then you'll see that I've highlighted the 10th the one there, oil and gas income per capita. Um, now that one has the great value of being easy to calculate and not endogenous to things like GDP, which is to say not shaped by the size of a country's GDP. Because all else equal, the poorer a country, the less diversified, the smaller the GDP will be, the bigger a share of the total GDP oil revenues will be. It sort of makes the, makes the oil sector look bigger and more important which is really a function of the country not being developed. Um, so oil income per capita has become um, a kind of, of convention and, and the most popular one today. And in part, that's because, I think to his great credit, Michael Ross, as he was compiling the data for his own work, immediately started publicly archiving this data. So right when people can get, um, especially graduate students in the room, um, and I'm going to come back to the graduate students in a few minutes, um, when you can get access to reliable data for the whole world, in terms of oil production and oil production per capita from 1932 to the present, that's amazing, right? You should all be writing thank you letters to Michael Ross. I um, mean, that kind of public generosity is, is, you know, too rare, I think, in political science. But um, it's because of that, in part, and because it's a, it's a, a, an improvement on all these past measures that it's become so common. Um, okay, we got all these measurement choices what to do about them. Um, I'll tell you why I think that despite its, its wide availability um, and its fair, fairly easiness, its ease of calculation, oil income per capita, it's, it's problematic in, in an important way um, that development economists have figured out a way to solve and which I've used to try to improve on past measurement. So the broad goal if it's possible that it's measurement driving this, this divergence of, of conclusions, is to think about what we really mean when we think theoretically about what oil wealth is and why it's politically important. We really want to know, because it's usually governments that own these resource sectors, how much leverage does government's ownership and control of the resource sector give it over the average citizen? Right? What's the effect that a ruler can exert over citizens' everyday economic and political decisions by virtue of owning that oil sector? I think that that question is really at the root of most of the theories we have of oil wealth and politics. And I'm going to base the measure that I present on it. Um, however, I'm going to suggest we need to correct for purchasing power parity as well. Um, the pithy and kind of, of um, fun version of this is the Economist's Big Mac Index, 
right, where they chart for an array of countries what the average price of a Big Mac is um, around the world. Well, I have my own version of this. I call it the Graduate Stipend Index. And, you know, when I ask you all as graduate students, if you make, say, $18,000 a year as a graduate student assistant in Chicago, um, but then you get to go do field work in a country like Indonesia or Zambia, and you get to take the same $18,000 with you. Suddenly your buying power increases radically because the cost of living is so much less there. And that's the logic behind, one, economists in development economics increasingly using GDP per capita that's been corrected for purchasing power, and my decision to use both oil income per capita corrected and the measure that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe in just a moment. Um, and then use these two having been, having been corrected. So once we do this, we wind up with a kind of weighted score. So that, for example, in absolute terms, China doesn't have a bigger economy than the United States. But in purchasing power parity terms, it does, because the cost of living is so much lower there um, than it is in the United States. And so in relative terms, when we account for purchasing power, the effect is, in fact, bigger. And the fuel income per capita equivalent of this is something like the following. If a country brings in $100 per person um, or $400 per person, um, what's the political effect likely to be in a country like Canada, where the average income is close to $40,000 a year, or Nigeria, where the average income is maybe a 20th of that, right? maybe $2,000 a year? Um, so the effect is, is you know, dramatically different once we account for buying power. But the absolute figure, that is oil income per capita, um, misses that entirely. And I'm suggesting that we really need to account for that. And once we do, we're likely to get a better sense of what the actual effect is. Um, so I've developed this new measure, which I call rent leverage. And it's based on that initial concept, which is kind of hypothetically speaking, what a ruler's ownership of a resource sector provides that, that person in terms of ability to influence an average citizen's economic and political decisions in any given day. And it's fuel income per capita divided by the purchasing power parity corrected GDP per capita. Um, and I've also now weighted fuel income per capita for purchasing power parity. So weighted it in the same way that GDP per capita is, is corrected. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. But this is, this is for my money, um, conceptually closest to what we all think we're talking about when we argue that there is a politics of resource wealth. Um, we can we certainly talk about that um, in the, the discussion period. But um, Once I developed the idea, the, the sort of the, the, the logic of the measure, um, I included it in a global data set, so data for the entire world between 1960 and 2009, alongside the convention, which is fuel income per capita. Um, now, the nice thing about building on the original measure, fuel income per capita, is it also has nearly complete coverage across almost the entire world for almost the entire um, time series, so almost the, the entire 50-year period. Um, and allows me to account for a pretty thorough set of other factors. And what I find is this. Rent leverage, pretty much no matter how I cut it, and no matter how I specify the models, is consistently stabilizing. And with the exception of its effect on autocratic breakdown, where it's uh, not both within and cross-country, um, all the other results are both a function of comparative across countries and chronological across time within countries. Now, fuel income, the sort of raw, absolute measure of fuel income per capita, is statistically insignificant, except in as much as it makes autocratic breakdown less likely, but actually the effect is quite small. Um, and the fact that the, the effects are slightly different for both autocra for autocratic longevity on one hand and democratic longevity on the other. Um, suggest that we need to start thinking and exploring more deeply why it is that both democracies and dictatorships survive longer as a function of oil wealth, but for what appear to be different reasons. That is as important as anything, because 
it leads us to think about the things that governments spend revenue on, right? Is it public goods or is it coercion? Is it um, club goods, right? You, you know, you pick a kind of important elite or politically dominant group and you favor them to the exclusion of others. Um, these are kind of the, the important questions that come out of this. Um, you know, is it invested in state building? One of the, the things that I found most important in, in my first project was the number of countries like Malaysia and like Indonesia which had precisely invested those windfall revenues during the first oil boom into strengthening the administrative capacity of their governments to do things like provide effective public education and build roads to places that had not been connected to important economic centers um, prior to that. Um, but it also, as I said, suggests um, that we need to think more carefully and, and sort of more thoroughly about why the effects are different across different regime types. And in particular, in a, in a, a research program like this one where people have been dichotomizing regimes, so they're either democratic or they're dictatorial, um, there's all of these, well, um, there was a conference here just a few years ago on all of the hybrid regimes um, that proved to be so durable despite their alleged position as halfway houses between one type and another. Um, this is one thing that I've not begin to, begun to explore yet systematically, but, but I, I have a feeling that um, there's, there's something important lurking in this large group of hybrid, hybrid regimes, many of which are in fact oil exporters. Um, but to come back to the policy implications, if there's no oil curse, there are other problems, right? Hiding behind the reality of oil wealth, which is, you know, publicly visible and reported on all the time and seemingly implicated in lots of stuff. But if it's not really the cause, then, then we need to figure out what is and figure out the extent to which, if possible, that relatively, you know, huge sum of revenues flowing into oil exporting countries can be used to solve the, the real problems. Um, so I'm going to stop the formal part now, uh, in part because I want to leave as much time for questions and discussions and um, devastating criticisms as I can. Not really that third part, but anyway, I'll stop here and uh, just open the floor to questions. Thank you. I'm a graduate student in anthropology, so uh, the methodologies you come up with with regard to this uh, unit of analysis is way much different than we do. Yes. No, I'm not one of those guys. Okay. In fact, I was just talking with um, Ian, who's in here somewhere. There he is. Um, yeah, he was, he was asking, I, I, um, as somebody who's done, you know, a fairly good bit of, of ethnographic research, not in this particular p paper, but, you know, over the years, um, I don't think I fit neatly into that, that mold. But anyway. Um, yeah, and I really find it troubling to, to accept the idea of I'm from Africa and I'm from Ethiopia, which has no oil actually. We have a saying, uh, God did not put a curse on us with precious stones and oil, but he blessed us with precious bones because, you know, all the archaeological findings, sure. the first human, homo sapiens, every, every, you know, many of them was found here. So if you take, uh, I know you focus on Asia, but if you take, Nigeria, Sudan, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Libya, I mean, everywhere we have seen with the coming of oil in uh, civil war and, you know, uh, we have different perception of property, probably, I can't speak for the whole Africa, even the political scientists. Yeah. That's a good question, and, and, you know, one of the reasons that the traction of the resource curse has been so powerful is precisely because of examples like this. Um, but examples like Nigeria and like Sudan, right, they beg the question, how functional democratic do you think that Sudan would have been without oil? Would it be a rich, prosperous democracy? Would it be like Switzerland, or would it be like Eritrea, right? What, what, it's, what is is Sudan likely to be without oil? And that's the important counterfactual, because it, 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 it requires us to ask, 
what we think is causing at, at root uh, the problems of a state like Sudan. And so, yes, we can mention Libya, and we can mention Sudan, and we can mention uh, Nigeria. We can also mention Tunisia, which for a good chunk of the late 70s, 80s, and 90s depended on oil for about a fifth of its GDP, and now is the one possible successor coming out of the Arab Spring. We can think about, again, a country like Malaysia, which should have been cursed by its oil wealth, and before that, its rubber and tin wealth, and now is a major producer of some of the most technologically advanced equipment um, that any of us use in this high technology world we, we currently populate. Um, and it's brought tens of millions of, of ordinary Malaysians out of poverty in a way that would not have been thinkable before. Um, and so my, you know, my, my point is not to say oil cannot be a part of negative stories, but we gotta do two things. First, we have to ask, you know, really, what would we expect in a country like Sudan, which I think we all agree is, is a serious failure without oil? What would we expect of, Lib of Gaddafi's Libya without oil? Well, we could expect that his political economy would have been different, um, but I'm not sure we can really make a case that all of the dysfunction today in Libya is a function of oil wealth. It's largely a function of Gaddafi. Now, Gaddafi would have looked different without oil, but still would have been Gaddafi's Libya. Um, and the second question is, you know, how do we explain then all the counter stories, all the success stories, right? People frequently turn to the United States, Canada, and Norway, right? Three advanced industrial democracies which built their diversified economies on the backs of resource revenues. I'm going to leave those out. They don't need to because there are plenty of developing country um, success stories to use as replacements for them. And that, I think, is the important, you know, that's kind of the, the, the important answer to a question like yours. I look next door to as many oil exporting autocracies as there are in Africa, and I see non-oil exporting, oil importing autocracies, and I ask, are they autocratic because they import the autocrat's oil from next door? Right? I mean, that, that again, is the, is the important question. How democratic would we expect Angola in 1995 to be without oil? Would we expect it to be, I don't know, Turkey? Probably not. We would expect it to be um, camera, right? Pauline? It's not about distribution. It's, it's, you know, you take the total size of the purchasing power corrected GDP and divide it by the population. So that's not, that's not state distribution. No, that's not about distribution. That's the thing, because a distribution measure would be an, 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 an equality or an inequality measure. And this is just a total size relative to share of population or to size of population. And so it, it could be the case that three people own it all, and it would be the same as if everybody had exactly the same share. That is a weakness. That's a whole other ball of wax, um, and it's one that none of these kinds of measures can get at. We need to have a measure, uh, you know, uh, an accurate sense, which we don't currently have in cross-national terms, of exactly what you're asking about. But this is not that. This is a simply what's the total economic productivity in a country, however distributed, and how much does it produce for every average citizen? We know not all citizens are average, and there's lots of lumpiness in economies. But this can't capture that in the same way that regular GDP per capita can't either. Right? Equatorial Guinea now has, for at least some of the fat last five years, the highest GB GDP per capita anywhere on the planet. And it's a tiny country with an even tinier economic elite 
who are massively rich. They're like Bill Gates rich in purchasing power terms, um, where you know, the vast majority of the rest of the population is living in, in horrifically squalid poverty. Um, but the GDP per capita figure totally misses that. That would be norm more normatively satisfying to find a cure for the, you know, the, the deficiencies of the Gini coefficient and other inequality measure. I have not, I have not found that silver bullet, unfortunately. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was actually calling on the, the, the young lady right in front of you who had her hand just up a minute ago. I'll come to you next. I don't have, I don't have that. What I do have is a, here we go. Here is the scatter plot of <laughs> rent leverage, which is all the little blue dots, versus oil income per capita. And so they correlate at a little under 40%, um, which is, you know, good by some accounts. But if they're trying to capture the same thing, really not very good at all. And I don't know if I have the, the condensed one. If you look, the vast majority of these observations fall at less than $10,000 per capita. And that's because even a country that produces lots of oil, um, rarely, you seem to be relatively few observations where we're getting you know, $30,000 plus per head coming from oil. And so really, most of the uh, dispersion is down here. Um, and so they don't compare all that well. So I don't have the descriptives with a lot of side-by-sides, um, but I do have this. And let me. The truth is, I don't remember whether I have. I don't know. I don't have the other, uh, the other dispersion one. I have a separate scatter plot, with, um, with the, the right side limit set at ten thousand dollars a head, and that captures basically all of this and provides a much more detailed picture of how much dispersion there is. Um, Are those fifty dots for each of these handfuls? This is for the entire data set. So there are actually about five thousand of them floating around. It's just that they're really heavily concentrated here, which is why. The, 5,001 actually is a little more visually useful. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, you cited an explanation uh, how adversary uh, uh, concentrated, concentrated of wealth in very small portions of the population. But it's pretty clear that the government uh, is more thoroughly entrenched yeah. because of oil issue and the lack of sanitation and things like that. It would be more readily accomplished in poor countries like Central African Republic or Eastern Europe. Also, earlier you mentioned uh, Nigeria, uh, and I think it's equally clear that oil has very, very clearly played a, a very big role in that country's development. Not to say that all of its problems come from oil, yeah. but clearly all of the problems in the Delta and a lot of development corruption are a direct result of, of oil. And so, so do you just view those as sort of aberrations against the more general trend in Africa, and especially in Africa, less yeah. so in Sierra Leone? I prefer the term outlier. Um, but yes, basically, right? I mean, if there's a general trend in a particular direction, and, and I'm pretty confident, having run hundreds of models to try to c crack the finding that this rent leverage measure um, seems to have on, on that, that's stabilizing, I can't do it, right? No matter what I do, I can't crack that one. Um, and so my, my thinking on a case like Nigeria, which I, 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 I agree with you entirely about, I think it's one of those fundamental outliers. And so, you know, the, the, the implication of a regression finding like this is not that oil never has negative effects. It may have both positive and negative, and under certain conditions, the negative may be amplified. And so Nigeria may very well be one of those cases. But on average, the effect is not Nigeria, on average. And that was, um, you know, kind of the logic of my first big project. And in fact, the, the first paper that came out of that was um, kind of inductive in the sense that I had no theoretical horse in the race and just wanted to see what the effect of oil was on political stability because Nigeria and Algeria and Iran at the time dominated our theoretical thinking about the effects of oil wealth. And it turned out that they were the outliers. And I still believe that. But I believe it because that's, you know, the data say that really strongly. Yes. No. 
it's logged in the it's logged in the analysis, but but not for the purposes of illustration here. Logs don't, you know, I mean, in real terms, if I put this up and all the figure, all the numbers down here are between like one and, and eight point five, it doesn't tell us anything concrete. Yeah, but uh, you know, doesn't the relationship between the two becomes like better? The, the correlation is bigger when when you talk about logs and when you talk about logs. The correlation actually doesn't get any stronger when you log them, okay. and and you know the the results are substantively the same. Um, but in fact, I, I also have a substantive question. I mean, see, it's about the hybrid regime question that, that you mentioned during the presentation. Because as you know, <coughs> theoretically, it uh, looks like a hybrid regime, say, or one of the four, an electoral authoritarian regimes due to their nature, they have no less incentives to spend oil revenues on state capacity and more... Well, arguably. To, arguably, to, they have less incentive, to right? Elections, yeah. to buy elites, you know, and, and things like that. So I'm curious whether, you know, you, uh, at least part of your analysis, you try to, you know, to, to play out with this variable and, you know, to what extent the, 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 uh, you find some uh, The quick answer is that I have not begun to dig into whether there are important and special effects for hybrid regimes, including electoral authoritarian ones. Um, so that's, I mean, you know, I haven't gotten to that yet, but, I, but that's a big part of what I want to do in the book is to get us thinking about the fact that not all regimes in the world any longer are dictatorships or democracies. I mean, it was never the case. It's especially not the case now because there are so many that comfortably and durably inhabit that middle ground. As to your specific point about electoral authoritarian regimes not having an incentive to invest in state building, my answer is Malaysia and Mexico, both of which have comparatively strong states in regional terms and for quite some time were durably electoral authoritarian. And that is, you know, a little bit of a puzzle if it's the case that these kinds of regimes don't invest in, in functioning states. It may be that some don't. And that's in need of explanation, but I don't. I, I think it's definitely the case that not all don't. Were you thinking of a particular one? Mm, well, the, the examples that you brought in the very beginning of the talk, like Venezuela or Russia. Yeah, Venezuela always had a weak state. It had a it had a preciously weak state long before oil came online, and it's had a patrimonial state, you know, since decades before it was exporting oil. It's always had a weak state. Then it had a weak oil state, um, and now it still has a weak oil state, um, you know, with, with Chavez's successor. Um, so that one, I'm less inclined to, to lay entirely at the doorstep of oil wealth. Yes? That would be giving an awful lot of responsibility to oil. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, Putin is a lot about oil, but not entirely about oil. Um, he didn't get where he is today simply by selling oil out of the back of a truck. Um, but I guess um, mechanically what I would say is in the, in the first project, I looked really specifically at big jumps and falls in the price of oil by accounting specifically for the effects of the, the oil boom of the 70s and early 80s and for the bust of the late 80s and, and 90s. And, and I intend to do that with this one too. And I think there are a couple of ways to do it. One is to treat that 80s to 90s boom or a bust as a, as a bust again and the 1999 to about 2014 boom as a boom again. Another one is simply to include a variable, just include the price of oil or its log. Um, to see whether there's something kind of international systemic um, at work about the price of oil, which you're suggesting may be important. And I agree with you. Um, I haven't gotten there yet. Like, I haven't gotten to this question of, of dealing specifically with electoral authoritarianism. Yes? Need to care about citizens because it has oil wealth. And so 
it's not about leverage, but it's about you know how you create autonomy or um, you know. So how does rent leverage as a concept use cost naturally? I mean, I understand the problem that you yeah. can't sort of like what problem you're solving before, but how does it tell us how will it be able to tell us how citizens are affected or unaffected by the fact that we create rent? Yeah. Here, let me compare it. Let's see where. There we go. So. This is my first cut at putting together a set of kind of preliminary or intervening indicators that I'm going to hypothesize are connecting oil wells to this stabilizer effect. And basically what I envision is the full suite of pH models where I hypothesize that oil is going to have an effect on you know, an array of indicators for each of these concepts. Um, and then see the extent to which those play out on democracy, on autocracy, under some kind of hybrid system. So this is my, my choice set so far. If you have other ideas that you think I ought to be including, uh, please make them on here. I will do my best to um, chase them down. Because I really do want to get at you know, the heart of your question, which is why? Why exactly is it stabilizing under different circumstances, but systematically stabilizing? Now that really is the most interesting question. And I think the quest, the answer to our autocracy is going to be not very normal to decide upon here, but it enables club goods and coercion. It's just it's the number of barrels of oil and billion cubic meters of gas valued, and then the value divided by the population. Total value of oil and gas production divided by population is fuel income per capita. And, and that's different from the oil and gas consumption? No, that's, that's the one I just described. That is, in fact, oil, gas, or fuel income per capita. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
if that were, you know, if everyone thought of it all the time, then the recruitment department, you know, the recruitment folks in the University of Michigan Political Science Department could offer 40% of a graduate stipend, you know, competing with NYU and Columbia. And when students came back who were been offered admissions and funding at both and said, well, I really want to come, but NYU has given me all this, all this money, all they would have to say is, let's look at what your dollar buys in Ann Arbor versus what it buys in New York City. And they would immediately decide to come to Michigan. Not to, well, this, why doesn't it always work? Why don't people always realize it and come? Maybe. See? Yeah. You just need the, you know, the right critical gravity of good cooks in Ann Arbor. It's not like you need massive, unlimited variety of restaurants. You just need enough good cooks. Self-promotion. Yeah. Yes, I don't have, I have those results in raw form, but I don't have them neatly. Like these, these results look pretty, these tables, and so I'm happy presenting them. But I don't have the, the ones where I've included the weighted fuel income per capita too. But it changes things dramatically because fuel income goes from being insignificant, basically irrelevant, to being strongly stabilizing and significant across all model specifications. And that to me is even more interesting, that suddenly I'm getting both, both pur purchasing power weighted measures exerting the same effect and correlating more strongly. Well, because they, they're, they're capturing two different angles, right? One of the interesting things about some of the contrarian studies of oil wealth, so Basada and Lay, this, this big World Bank book by uh, Letterman and Maloney uh, in 2007, is that they found that both angles, both abundance, which is like fuel income per capita or some variant of it, and dependence, which is some variant of rent leverage, are statistically important. Right? They're, they're, they're causally important in their own right. And so it makes good sense now, theoretically, to have them both in the mix. But they both remain significant, even when you leave one or the other out. And then when you put them both in, they each have the same effect as if one or the other was left out. Um, and that's the basic logic, is that the two are capturing conceptually different things, different parts of the same phenomenon. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, one more layman question. Uh, is this decrease of price, uh, oil price, uh, if it compensates for longer period of time, do you have any from your research any implication how it affects the status like since President Putin seems to have been a little yeah. bit humble after the? I would never describe him as humble. Oh. I don't know anyone who describes him as humble. <laughs> However, the Russian Treasury, whatever that, the, the finance ministry, assumes an oil price of $110 per barrel in constructing annual budgets, which is to say, when they lay out plans for how much they're going to spend in 2015, back in 2014, they assumed that oil would be 110 or more. It's not. So the question is, like, how do you account for, you know, how do you, make, how do you deal with that shortfall? You can't just, well, you could just print money. That doesn't work very well. Like Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe tried it, and he had 10,000% inflation. Um, so it doesn't work well. So what's going to happen? Well, you know, you have patronage, which can be funded by oil. You have coercion, and you have ideology, um, like three basic toolboxes. Putin's going to have to figure out something to do. I'm not going to. I wouldn't predict that Putin's going to fall anytime soon. But he'll have to figure out something to do with that giant sucking sound that was the difference between current oil prices and 110. At some point, he'll have to make tougher choices. Yes? Complication on something you said earlier, and then I have a related question. Uh, earlier you said that the uh, oil that was produced in the United States is a variety of the rich of being sold in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, we, we don't export oil or gas. No, comes down to the West Coast mostly. Yeah.
certainly a part of the reason. So Valerie Bunce had this cool article. Was it, was it 1986, The Empire Strikes Back? Um, yeah, anyway, so she had this article pre-Soviet collapse called The Empire Strikes Back that it dealt in part with, you know, this giant fiscal burden of subsidizing all of these unproductive um, <coughs> Soviet bloc, you know, Eastern Bloc economies. Um, and in part, they were subsidized with oil, right, in the same way that Cuba's economy has since uh, the, the Chavez era and, and the, now the Maduro era been subsidized by Venez cheap Venezuelan oil. Um, and you know, when the price of oil collapsed, it really undercut the ability of the Soviet government to keep providing that subsidy. So, you know, um, I would like to make a big provocative statement like it was all about oil, and then I could be arguing with the guy across the street who said, no, Ronald Reagan killed the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, neither of us would be right, but we would both have captured a part of the answer. Stability is, is enhanced by oil wealth. Right, right. Yes. The question I think that she was asking, what I'm thinking of, is what Malarkey is asking, what is the effect of the oil on the common people? When you have a plutocracy, they're sure. sending all of the oil money to their state bank account, and the people are starving. You have that situation, which seems to be more of a minority. It, in some. In, in, I mean, that's definitely true. And, and Equatorial Guinea is, you know, as, as, as much a kind of micro-kleptocracy as you can imagine, with a tiny, tiny elite in an already small country really, really getting rich, like really getting Bob, you know, Bill Gates rich, not Bob Gates rich, Bill Gates rich, mixing them up. Um, so political economists, we mix, mix up our, our elites. Um, Nigeria is, is a kind of egregious example, but, you know, in, in terms of scope and magnitude of the, you know, of the, of the disparity, nothing like Equatorial Guinea. In, in, its, um, in its own way, one could say Saudi Arabia is a very interesting example. One family is Equatorial Except that they're marrying the entire country. So, like, you know, half of the Saudi population is actually part of the royal family now. The thousands and thousands of princes, and so when the, you know the when the the original set of sons, all of whom are um, you know well along in life, um, are gone, then there's going to be if you look at the, you know the pyramid of the Saudi royal family, it suddenly goes it gets huge, and the tails just go out and out endlessly in in all directions, and that's because of this conscious effort to marry important tribal families into the Al Saud in order to create this kind of, of familial institution that prevented conflicts over succession, except that too many people are part of it now. But you're right, 30 million people, most of whom are under the age of 30, at some point are going to be dissatisfied with, with you know, a pretty narrow concentration of wealth. And you see that manifesting. except that they're busy trying to kill our shale industry, right? It's not that tight. I mean, it's tight, tight, but it's been, a, you're right, it has been around for a very long time. But, you know, this conscious decision by the Saudis to refuse to cut production, in fact, to amp it up, is a very, very intentional effort to see just how soft the Canadian and American um, shale oil sectors are. Right? Well, that's it is, it is, but it's reflective of, you know, a, a long series of similar episodes over the last 50 years where the Saudis have intentionally, and we've intentionally done things that flew in the face of what is alleged to be this, you know, solid, un unshakable alliance, which is to say we still had a lot of differences. Oh, it's still the overwhelming share, kind of like my home state of Alaska, of government revenues.
concept that's really ugly and hard? The reason is that we have a bunch of research on the effect of oil on democracy, a bunch of research on the effect of oil on, did I just say democracy or autocracy? The other, okay, so autocracy, the other one. Um, and we haven't had any real sustained effort to look at that large number of regimes in between, right? And in mechanical terms, that's usually like between minus 5 and plus 5 on the Pauli scale, which runs from minus 10 to 10. Um, and so we don't have any good theories to guide us, right? So the first stage of this is going to have to be largely inductive, seeing what the data tell us. Um, but, you know, this is a set of regimes that don't fit neatly into the, you know, neatly mechanismed theories we have of the political economy of democracy or autocracy. And it strikes me that given the growing numbers, um, it's long overdue. But also the incredible diversity of stuff. But I think people don't write about it because yeah. it's such a total mess. Well, people do write about it, right? People write about oil and regime type, and people write about hybrid regimes. But, the, you know, there's not any overlap yet. So, yes. I'm sorry. Civil War onset, uh, one or zero. I also have the idea that it's a continuous measure where there are you know, varying points of the civil conflict. Um, and I don't have that set of proposal here. But the point is simply um, the aim is to look not just at one kind of regime change, but a number of kinds um, of varying degrees of intensity as well as that constant change. Thank you very much. Thank you.